It's been a while since my last Horus Heresy Guide, but finally I have returned to the 31st millennium to take on my third video of the series, focusing on the 4th Legion, the Iron Warriors. I would begin the creation of the Son of Perturabo by first clipping away the parts required to build a Mark VI Space Marine legs and torso. After cleaning the parts of mold lines and sprue tabs, the parts were glued together, leaving me with the basis of the conversion. Taking inspiration from the Iron Warrior's contempt to Dreadnought, I wanted to add some molecular bonding studs to the torso. But first, space needed to be made on the chest. This was done by first clipping away the buckle and the straps. This removed most of the detail, but further trims were needed with a scalpel in order to completely flatten out the surface. The knife was used in a scraping motion, lightly smoothing out the surface until I was left with a smooth torso. While this sort of work is often best performed before parts are assembled, as long as you wait for the glue to fully dry and don't apply undue pressure, you should have no problems. In order to make space for the studs, four 1mm holes were drilled into the right side of the torso in a square pattern. The holes were not drilled the entire way through though. By keeping the holes shallow, only about half a millimetre, it would allow the ball bearings to protrude from the surface. To fix the ball bearings into place, Superglue would be used, but instead of applying this straight from the bottle, I instead placed a small amount on the tip of a wire and used this to place a tiny amount of glue into the divot. This just helped prevent too much glue from being applied. With the glue in place, the small bearings were carefully placed into the recesses. With all the balls in place, the result was raised half spheres, which mimicked the appearance of the molecular bonding studs. In the past, I've always leaned into the more technical aspects of the Iron Warriors, focusing on things like heavy melee weapons and bionics. But this time around, I wanted to focus on the ancient Greek aspects of the Iron Warriors' homeworld, Olympia. This would be achieved by building a Breacher Sergeant and equipping him with a shield and spear, which would represent a power weapon. These were taken from the Stormcast Eternal Vindictus kit, to join these two kits together, I first had to clip away the upper part of the spear arm. The cut was made along the edge of the forearm's armor and, once removed, was cleaned up and trimmed flat. The spear was looking a little too ornate for the grim demeanor of the Iron Warriors, so the various spikes and details were shaved and clipped back, returning the spear to a more bare bones and utilitarian appearance. The Vindictor forearm would be attached to a regular Mark VI right arm, but again, more cutting was required. The forearm below the elbow armor was clipped away and then compared against the replacement part. The two parts weren't sitting properly against each other, so more trimming was made. Once I was happy with the fit, the upper arm was glued to the torso before attaching the forearm to it. Following the same clipping and trimming steps as before, the left shield-carrying arm was liberated from its upper arm and glued to a Mark VI bolter holding arm but the shield wasn't attached just yet. Before the shield could be attached, it first needed to have its distinctly Stormcast motif removed from it. Much like the chest armor, the emblem was shaved away one small step at a time. With most of the detail removed, the surface was scraped flat before being glued to the forearm. One staple of my previous Iron Warrior conversions that I was keen to include though were the Mark III shoulder pads. The large, riveted trim matched the design of the forearm armor and the shield, helping to continue the theme whilst also bulking out the model somewhat. From here, the regular Mark VI backpack was glued onto the back. In order to carry a power weapon, the Breacher had to be made into a sergeant and so needed a suitable helmet. Rather than reaching into my vast Mark III bits box, I instead grabbed one of the Mark II helmets found in the new Heresy vehicle kits. But, to keep things with tradition, a Mark III helmet's plume was picked up too. In order to join these two parts, the inside of the plume required a little clipping and shaving, along with the removal of the rivets from the top of the helmet. With both parts lining up, the plume was glued to the head, and the head was glued to the torso. With most of the model built, all that was left were a few small extra details and ornaments. The first of these would be a trophy hanging from the belt. One end of a fine chain was superglued to the waist and allowed to dry. Once firmly attached, the chain was cut to length and the other end was glued to the waist also, allowing the chain to hang between the fixture points. To keep the chain solid, more glue was added across its length, 
locking the links into place. The trophy itself would be created from a Mark VI helmet, but rather than attaching the entire helmet, the faceplate was roughly clipped away and a jagged edge was cut in. This resulted in the appearance of a destroyed helmet that could be attached to the end of the chain without protruding too far outside of the model's profile. Finally, one of the melter bombs from the Mark VI kit was attached to the other side of the model to represent the breaching charges, completing the conversion. The painting process was started with a black primer. This was applied through my airbrush, but how you apply isn't important. What is important is that it's dark enough to give us some strong shadows in those recesses. For this guide, I'll be using paints from the Tooth and Coats range, and the first of these is Cold Corpse Blue. This dark bluish gray would be applied via a dry brushing technique. This essentially involves loading up a fairly large brush with some paint before working the paint through the bristles and removing some of the excess onto a piece of paper. With the dry brush prepped, I began to drag it across the whole model using a series of light but broad strokes. This caused the paint to be transferred to the hard edge details and flat surfaces, but the deeper recesses remained untouched. As I had used a black primer here, these areas remain black and so help to create the illusion of shadows. By using the dark grey blue of Cold Corpse Blue across the whole model, it would help to create a blued steel effect for the Iron Warrior's power armour. Using a similar dry brushing technique, some cuirass leather was also applied across the armour. This time, however, the paint was targeted mainly into the shaded areas. The deepest recesses were still avoided, but the paint was applied to the undersides of the arms, the insides of the legs, and anywhere that faced down. Using the reddish brown of cuirass leather had two effects. The first was the appearance of rust and dirt on the armor, something that is perfect for representing chaos forces. The second was that the red hue contrasted against the paint that I had been laid down in the last step, helping the blue to stand out even further. With some starting hues in place, I could begin work on actually applying a metallic sheen to the armor. This was done with a highlight of Sukkot Silver. Highlights involve applying fine lines of paint to the hard edges of surfaces and details, usually with a paint that is lighter than the base color. This causes the edges to stand out and helps to increase the level of detail in the model. In addition to giving the edges a highlight, a few very thin scratches were also applied across the surfaces. This gave the impression of damage to the armor's surface, revealing the untarnished metal beneath, helping to convey that metallic appearance. After applying the metallic paint, I felt that it looked a little too pronounced and didn't quite blend into the armor as well as I would have liked it to. So, in order to blend it back in, a glaze of cold corpse blue was created. This was done by mixing the paint with water to create a very thin, translucent mixture. When applied across the armor, it subtly adjusted the tone of the metallics. Not only did it dull down the metallic sheen slightly, but it also gave it a subtle blue shade, which helped to blend it back into the base colors. The glaze was applied in several thin layers, allowing each layer to dry before applying the second. This allowed me to finally adjust how strong the glaze was and kept the transition smooth. Like before, some cuirass leather was thinned out into a glaze and applied across the metallic paints. This time around, I focused on the recessed areas, much like I had done with the earlier dry brushing. Again, this just helped to soften the intensity of the silver paint, whilst giving areas a slight rusted and weathered look. The rusted effect would be pushed even further by mixing up a glaze of fur cloak. This orangey brown paint was used to add small spots of more intense rust. Where the previous glazes were applied over larger areas, this particular mix was focused mainly into the deep recesses. With the armor completed, work could begin on the iconic Iron Warrior's hazard stripes. The flat, featureless surface of the shield was the perfect location for this. So, in order to paint the yellow stripes, I began by first applying some cuirass leather. The edges of the stripes were first marked out with fine diagonal lines, spaced evenly from each other. Once I was happy with the spacing, the lines were filled in to create the thick, chunky stripes. Cuirass leather was chosen for this step as it would allow for an easier transition between the black primer and the bright yellow of the next few steps. Speaking of which, some dark sun yellow would be used to add a bit of color to the stripes. The paint was thinned down slightly before being painted across the stripes, painted in the last step. 
The thin coats of paint were layered up to create a smoother finish, but getting perfect coverage here wasn't a priority. I wanted the model to have that grimy look, and a slightly patchy coverage in places would simply add to this. To help the lines stand out even further, a little skulky yellow was used as a highlight to tackle the top edge of each hazard stripe. Applying a small line here wasn't completely necessary, but it helped to lift the stripes even further off the dark background. Now if you're like me, then you may want to paint that trophy helmet in the colours of the Imperial Fist. If so, simply follow the same steps that I used to tackle the hazard stripes. Once again, another glaze of cuirass leather was created and applied across the shield and the helmet, which helped to continue that rusted and dirty look that had been achieved over the armour. The shield was completed by applying a few small scratches and scuffs across the yellow stripes. This was done with some Doom Death Black, and was approached in much the same way that I applied the metallic scratches to the armour. From here, the smaller details could be focused on. The first of these were the areas between the armour panels. Now, depending on how neat you were with your earlier applications, you might need to return these to their original black first. But, if you were careful, you can jump straight into adding some highlights to those ridges, first using some Cold Corpse Blue, followed by the slightly lighter Wolf Grey. Where the last highlight was applied across the length of the ridge, this was applied as a single spot instead, creating a point of more intense light. For the red areas, which included the plume, eye lenses and wrappings around the spear, I began with a base coat of Royal Cloak. This gave me a deep, rich purple to start off the reds with. Some highlights were then applied using some Sanguine Scarlet, transforming the purple into a rich red. Finally, some small spots of Sanguine Scarlet were dotted along the most prominent points of the edges to really increase the sharpness of those points. With the model itself completed, work could begin on the base, which I had sourced from the Sector Mechanicus basing kit. Like with the rest of the model, I had primed this black, but I wanted a bright white colour to contrast against the dark tones present in the rest of the model. To achieve this, I used a series of dry brushes, starting with Wizard Grey for the base colour. This was followed by the lighter grey of Carcaradon Grey, which was used to further lighten the base's shade. Finally, the pure white of White Star was used. This time around, it was applied a little more lightly than before in order to create some shading and transitions. While I'd achieved a lightly colored base, it was looking far too clean, so I opted to use some of Dirty Down's Rust. This stuff is incredible for achieving great looking rust effects easily and would be applied in two steps. The first step involved thinning down the paint with some water in order to create a kind of wash. This was painted into the recesses, which was assisted by the lower viscosity. This resulted in a less intense rust effect. To create spots of heavier rust, more dirty down rust was applied, but this time straight from the pot. This time around, the paint was applied in small focus spots. These not only made the rust look heavier, but it also helped to add a little extra texture. The base's rim was then cleaned up by painting it with some Doom Death Black. Now that the base was complete, the Iron Warrior could be removed from the temporary base that I'd used to hold it during painting. I'd only attached the Marine using a small amount of superglue, which meant it could be easily snapped away. Once removed, the undersides of the feet were cleaned up and the points where the feet would be attached to the base were also scraped back to bare plastic, allowing me to use plastic glue to reattach the model. Finally, the paintwork was sealed in by giving everything a coat of matte varnish, leaving me with this. And here we have the completed Heresy Era Iron Warrior Breacher Sergeant. While I made a few changes to a single model in this video, these don't all need to apply to every one of your models and can instead be spread out across a whole army. By just focusing these details onto a few select miniatures, such as unit leaders and characters, you can add a huge amount of theme to your army without having to dump a whole lot of time or money into it. Now this is the third guide of the series where I am tackling each of the legions in order. So if you haven't done so already, check out my previous Dark Angels and Empress Children's guides and expect to see a similar guide for the White Scars next. For those of you looking to recreate this miniature and colour scheme, 
I'll include all the kits and paints used in this guide in the description below, along with some affiliate links to where you can pick them up for yourself. Thank you to my ever wonderful patrons who keep this channel going, especially my expert tier and above supporters who are Big Tom, Jonathan Hart, Maciej Savitsky, Tim, Brush the Nim, Daniel Dowling, Joachim Falk, Casper Limborg, Morgan, Mr. Grimm, Pale Juice, Svedsman, and the Googles. If you're interested in supporting me too, you can find a link to my Patreon below, where supporters can get ad-free access to my videos, sneak peeks, a private Discord channel, and exclusive merchandise. Plus, you'll be helping me out in the process. So, until next time, thanks for watching, and goodbye.